I'm Graham McKenzie, uh, Chief Officer of Wandsworth Clinical Commissioning Group, and uh, along with Professor Peter Copelman, one of the two joint chairs of the South West London system over the past year. Um, it's good to see you all here. Thank you for coming to the event. Um, I hope this will be a good opportunity for uh, a dialogue and discussion around some important themes around the work of the South West London system. But obviously, fundamentally, our key theme for today is about integration and the journey ahead, really, across agencies uh, in making integration real to improve health and social care experience and outcomes for people across South West London. So thank you for being here today, but uh, on behalf of Peter and I, also thank you for your participation and engagement in the system throughout the year. I mean, today really represents the embodiment of much of that work. Um, today gives us an opportunity to showcase some of the work of the South West London system over the last year or so. Um, I'd highlight the annual report, which hopefully you will have picked up uh, a copy of uh, on your way in when you registered. Uh, please do take the opportunity to read it. I think it's a really good summary of uh, both the various programs of work that the system has been engaged in over the last year or so, but also some of the challenges and the work that we face together um, as we move forward. Um, on our programme today, I would particularly highlight that a little bit later, we will be spending some time reflecting and hearing about um, the work of uh, the small grant funded projects that have been uh, sponsored by the system. I think they are really at the heart of the work of the system. Obviously, we've run small grant schemes over a number of years now, and they provide really good opportunities to support innovation, change, and development in a range of service settings across health and social care. And so uh, I'm particularly looking forward to hearing more about those uh, in a form of a report to you all uh, later this morning. Um, clearly, the last 12 months um, has been a challenging time for a number of the member organisations who make up the South West London system and indeed for the system itself. We've seen some fairly radical fundamental changes in the, if you like, the architecture of the local NHS and social care um, as the Health and Social Care Act has become fully implemented in the last 12 months. So we've seen the abolition of PCTs, we've seen the formation and creation of uh, clinical commissioning groups, we've seen public health functions move from the former PCTs into local authorities in the main, but also some elements into Public Health England. We've seen the growing emergence of health and wellbeing boards and a much more central leadership role uh, for local authorities in helping shape and lead uh, the wider determinants of health. Um, so the architecture has changed fundamentally um, and the system has begun to reflect that. So we have uh, spent some time thinking about how we modify, refresh and change our membership structure and approach for the way forward to represent uh, the new organisations in a new approach. Um, there's also been some really important changes in um, the wider landscape and those partner organisations for whom we share common interests in terms of working on the priorities of supporting innovation, research and development, workforce development. So just to name a few, the emergence of Health Education for South London, uh, the Health Innovation Network um, and the Collaboration for Leadership in Health Research and Care obviously have all been equally in development and change during these uh, last few months. Uh, we have established, I think, some uh, good, a good start in terms of partnership work with the South West London system, and we absolutely look forward to that continuing. And I know there's some colleagues from uh, the wider partner organisations in the room today, so thank you for being here and for your support of the South West London system. So the theme for today is a really important area that is uh, clearly an area of emerging and strengthening national policy around integration. We're seeing shortly the formal introduction of integration transformation funds at local level across health uh, and social care and other areas of national policy that absolutely support this drive towards a more integrated approach to planning, commissioning and service delivery in order to uh, improve 
the service offer and the patient experience uh, locally. So it's a really important but uh, significantly challenging area of development work and one which cuts across the whole system, which is why I think it's such an important and relevant subject for us to spend some time on today. Um, I'm very pleased that we have a range of speakers um, with us today. Um, in a keynote address, which I'll introduce shortly, um, but also this afternoon there is a panel uh, session where various views and perceptions about the way forward for uh, integration will be presented to you and around which uh, I hope we will have a lively and engaged debate and discussion uh, in due course. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, all of the items and the contribution of all of the speakers as we go through uh, the event today. Um, I need to inform you that we do have a change in the published agenda. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Edward Scully, um, who was due to present the keynote address, is unwell um, and has had to send his apologies today. I am, however, immensely relieved and grateful that literally at the uh, 11th or the 12th hour, um, uh, Professor Ray Jones uh, agreed to uh, cover the keynote address um, this morning. Um, Professor Ray Jones is uh, a considerable friend to the South West London system and the network, um, and many of you will know of him or know him as Professor, professor of Social Work um, for Kingston and across St George's University. So a very warm welcome uh, to Ray, and if I could hand over to you now. We do anticipate there will be time for some questions and discussion with Ray after his uh, initial presentation, so please be thinking about those areas that you may wish to uh, talk to Ray about. Uh, I'm a social worker by background. I was the social services director uh, in Wiltshire from 1992 to 2006, uh, and uh, now I'm a research professor uh, in the faculty here and at Kingston University. I uh, got a grant, for example, from what was the AHSN, but now the South West London System, to do some research uh, with my colleagues on multi-professional health and social care teams, which we finished about 18 months ago. I've got a research project at the moment, uh, one of them uh, underway, about uh, serious case reviews in relation to child deaths and abuse of children, because what I spend my time doing when I'm not um, a research professor here for two days a week is for two days a week Every week I'm on site somewhere overseeing child protection improvement. So I've just come back from two days in Sandwell. It's Friday today, isn't it? Yeah, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Monday and Tuesday next week I'm in Tor Bay. The uh, week after I'm in um, the Isle of Wight. And the week after I'm in Devon. And it just actually works out every week I'm somewhere for two days overseeing child protection. And just in the spirit of talking about integrating health and social care, but we could also talk about our faculty now covering education as well, and when I'm uh, on site for those two days, on the first day, I spend my time meeting as many people as close to the front line as possible. So thinking of Sandwell this week, on uh, Wednesday I met with some frontline social workers, frontline team managers of social workers, I met with named nurses and named doctors and designated n uh, doctors and nurses in relation to child protection. I met with a, um, I'm not sure what the collective name for police officers is, but a bundle of police officers who deal with child protection uh, and didn't meet with any teachers this time, but I normally meet with primary school head teachers, etc. So I do that to get a flavour of what's happening, and then on the second day I have a sequence of formal meetings talking with uh, people about what they're doing on child protection, and then I chair a board meeting. So anyway, I spend my time doing that. So um, in addition to being, uh, being here, I'm out on the ground doing something else as well. What I thought I would do for about um, 20 minutes or so is do a little presentation, then I want to open up a conversation, and I'm just checking... Is it until 12 o'clock? OK. So I'm watching that clock over there. So I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then I want to open up a conversation. Because what I'm about to say in terms of speaking is a little bit historic. It goes through until the mid-2000s. And the world, as always, is moving all the time and has changed since then. So uh, the reflection I'd like us to have together is, where are we now? And uh, how does the architecture that we're all working within now in the changing health services and within the changing social care and local government um, infrastructure impact on our capacity and ability to uh, bring ourselves together in terms of integration. So what I want to talk about is why it's important to uh, be on the journey that we're on in terms of integration services. I want to say something about how we might be doing it and how we need to do it. 
than how we've done it in the past. Something about the impact it's had where we have done it in the past and something about some of the difficulties and dangers, although I won't spend too much time on that, I don't think, this morning. So why do we think it's important? And uh, the arguments that I would understand and I'm willing to make about integration is that it makes sense essentially for users and patients. And here's the first stumbling block. Are we going to call them service users or are we going to talk about patients? Uh, because one of the difficulties we have sometimes is we don't have a common currency in terms of the language we use. And we can offend each other by talking in terms of a script, uh, a language which doesn't um, feel natural for us. But it makes sense for users and patients. And uh, they see a much more coherent uh, response to them and their needs. They don't have to navigate the boundaries and the barriers and the gaps that we leave between our services if we can bring ourselves much more together. It's also an opportunity for us to build shared agendas and to deliver both for our partners and for ourselves. I've not seen this presentation for some time actually, so I'm not sure where it goes in a minute. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure it goes where I'm about to talk, speak, so I'll say it now. And one of the things that we've had around for a long time, it's had different terms and different bits of jargon. Value for money, best value, the three E's, was about how we actually drive economy, efficiency and effectiveness in terms of what we're doing. And what we're doing now with a uh, decreasing slice of uh, uh, money in terms of public funding. So how do we make sure that we're getting the best return on that money? And in terms of getting the best return on that money, it's the threes at the bottom there. And uh, one of the ways we can do it is making sure that we're using that money to best value across all our services. So a second reason beyond the sense to users and carers in terms of the integration agenda is it ought to make sense to us in terms of doing things better with the public money that we've got. And a bit about in improved imp interprofessional working there is that um, we are sometimes quite rivalrous with each other, aren't we? We sometimes think that our profession, uh, the job that we do, and the training that we've had, the experience and the expertise that we've got, is really special, and it is. But sometimes we think it's more special than some of the other professional groups that we're working with. And the bit of research that uh, uh, we got the funding from the AHSN, South West London System, to do, looking at health and social care teams. And this is what the title of the research was. The definition and deployment of differential professional competences in multi-professional health and social care teams. <laughs> We're still trying to get it published. <laughs> Actually, we did get it published in uh, health and social care in the community. And what we were asking in the health and social care teams, mental health teams for working age adults, mental health teams for older people, uh, learning disability community team, and a uh, team in Richmond uh, for uh, uh, younger disabled people and older disabled people who had physical impairment. And those teams were made up of social workers, community nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and indeed when we got into the community learning disability team, we had people like speech therapists, dietitians, etc., as well. And we had doctors of different types, general practitioners through to uh, psychiatrists, and we had clinical psychologists. The whole bundle, uh, a whole different range of different professions, and we were asking each of those professionals to say, what's special about your contribution, your core professional competences, uh, and what do you think are the core professional competences of other colleagues in your team. And we did that, and we saw it matched up, and then we also asked them to keep a diary for uh, only one week in terms of how they spent their time, and then we matched up what they said their particular contribution should be and was compared to how they actually spent their time and what they did. One of the things that came through from this was, and these were all integrated teams, in the sense these are all people working within the same context. They did actually, as a consequence of that, have a pretty good understanding about each other's contribution. And they had quite a strong profile in terms of valuing each other's contribution as well. The difficulty is that having that understanding didn't actually play out necessarily in how they spent their time. Because we didn't actually spend that much time working on how best to deploy that uh, expertise resource within those multi-professional teams. So we had the team in place but then people weren't their best deployed in terms of doing what they said they were best at doing. But in terms of interprofessional working, bringing people together gives us that opportunity to uh, improve interprofessional understanding and to improve interprofessional working. I call this the technology in terms of how we do it. It does require that we accept and agree and build general management. And that's quite threatening, I think, for uh, uh, each of us professionally because we're 
possibly used to being managed and supervised within our separate professional streams. But if you're going to build integrated services, you have to build integrated management because something has to actually hold it together in terms of oversight, deployment, accountability. And that accountability in terms of building governance arrangements, one of the things that still pulls us apart is that we have separate arrangements in terms of health and social care in particular, in terms of governance. NHS Foundation Trust compared to local authorities. And we have to find some way in care trust once upon a time, about 10 years ago, with a vehicle for doing that. Uh, and that drifted off the agenda very quickly. Uh, because one of the things that happens in terms of um, uh, the integration agenda is that we have champions who come and then they go. So at the time when Mr. Melbourne was the Secretary of State for Social Services and the Minister of State was, who was the Minister of State? Went on to become um, Secretary of State for the Environment or something. Come to me in a minute. Anyway, they were really strong on, they were really strong on Care Trust. But as soon as they left, Care Trust went off the, ra off the radar. That was their agenda. It wasn't the, the agenda for the new uh, ministerial team coming in who wanted to make their mark and they had to have something different to make their mark around. So one of the difficulties that we've got, I think, and a message I, I'd share with all of us, is that, to be honest, don't necessarily look for guidance from central government on this, because it won't be consistent and it won't last. Make it happen locally. If you think it's sensible for the reasons we were talking about just now, be champions for it locally, because that's where you can make it happen. If you just wait to, to hear it from the centre, especially at this time when I have to say, although the message and some of the pilots and some of the pilot funding is around integration, the reality is that we're becoming more fragmented. If that is what is happening nationally, it gives us the responsibility and the onus to actually see what we can make out of this locally. And the formal agreement stuff is the legislation which is still in place, but um, uh, Section 28A agreements, Section 31 agreements, going back to the 1918-1999 NHS Community Care Act, uh, which is the, if you like, again, sort of part of the technology in terms of how we legally might do this. They've got no value at all. They're important in terms of writing stuff down because we have to give ourselves a legitimate mandate in terms of what we're doing. But to be honest, if we fall out with each other, no one's going to enforce those agreements. So the way that we make integration really work is by signing up to it collectively, locally, and uh, being champions for it ourselves. And a part of that requires that we're around for long enough to do that as well. It's really difficult to build shared agendas joint commitments if we're not around long enough to actually build trust with each other. And one of the things when I say when I'm out doing what I do on child protection is how do you do child protection locally? And people tell me about that board meeting, that committee. And I say, how much time do you actually spend drinking coffee with each other? How much time do you spend on the way home in the evening maybe just dropping off to the pub for a quick drink? How much time do you spend building a relationship? Little story. When I was a social services director, this is absolutely true. Some things I say you may believe aren't true and they may not be. I may just be winging it. Okay, but this is true, this bit. And uh, whenever anybody as a senior, if you like, um, person from another organisation turned up on my patch, and I was in Wiltshire for 14 years, new chief constable, new in those days chief executive of the health authority, new director of education. And within the first two or three months, we, my wife as well, made sure we had them around for dinner. Because what I needed to do was to get some understanding about them and I wanted to start building a relationship with them. Because it was only by having that relationship we could actually build up that commitment to each other. So I wasn't just seen as nicking money off them to solve my problems in terms of budget. Or I saw them nicking money off my budgets to solve their problems. Waiting lists were big at the time, for example, as they are now. We were trying to build a joint relationship and a joint agenda, but you need to be around long enough to do that. And that's really difficult at the moment, isn't it? With all the churn and the change that's going on. And that bit about interprofessional respect at the bottom there is about those comments just now about different professionals respecting each other and valuing each other and understanding enough about each other to know what each other's competences and core skills and expertise would be. And that comment just now about being around for long enough is it does require a natural lifetime and time scale, some of this. It's not a quick fix. We're pretty good at quick fixes which don't stick. And all those things that we pilot and then the agenda moves on and we never follow through. We're not good with Balbin in terms of complete finishers, are we? How many, how many people here know about Balbin? 
How many of you are great shapers? Great ideas, really excited, making things happen, wanting to do something which is adventurous, yeah? How many of you can stick with the boring stuff and then making it stick and completing finishing? You're a really valuable person. <laughs> keep, keep your hand up because if you want to make things happen, that's the person you need to be offering the job to. Because loads of us have got great ideas, but we enjoy the excitement of that. We don't stick around long enough to actually deliver on them and to make sure that we get the return on the investment. And that's Wiltshire. Sometimes I feel I have to say it, show that because not everybody knows where Wiltshire is, where I used to work. Uh, and that little square bit over there is Swindon, because when I was there for half of the time anyway, Swindon with its quarter million population was a part of Wiltshire. Uh, and the rest of Wiltshire was Swindon over there. And the rest of Wiltshire, the north of the county, was, I think it's 10, I think it's 10 there, 10 market towns of populations of about 25, 30,000. And the south of the county down here was a lot of sheep and soldiers. Uh, a lot of soldiers, about 60,000 of them. Probably millions of sheep, actually. Um, but I wasn't too worried about the sheep. I was sometimes quite worried about the soldiers. Um, so that was, that was uh, Wiltshire with its population of uh, 700,000 uh, when we had Swindon as a part of it as well. And what we did was that we conceptualised together health, policing, education, social services, roads and highways, anything you can think about that's public service really. We divided Wiltshire conceptually into 20 community areas, each of which had populations, once Swindon wasn't there, of about 20, 25,000. And we used those conceptualised um, community areas, each of which were made up of a, of a um, collection of parishes and parish councils and town councils as the building blocks for everything that we did across the public sector. And those community areas were partly based on GP catchment areas, they were partly based on school catchment areas, etc. The best agreement that we could get across all the public services. And we then used that, as, as I say, the way that we developed, organised and managed all our public services across Wiltshire, which is really helpful in terms of building integrated services. Because one of the things that's helpful to have are boundaries which we can agree on in terms of what the building blocks are. And then we went through a sequence of steps. Uh, this was integrating health and social care in the community for adults and older people. Well, older people are adults, but for adults. Initially, we had um, link workers, people who uh, were funded. Anybody here still remember Family Health Service Authorities, FHSAs? Yeah. OK. So the, that, hey, this isn't that long ago, actually. This is 15 years ago. Yeah, it's only 15 years ago. And yet, um, how many iterations have we had since then? FHSAs, area health authorities, or health authorities, then CCGs, no, not CCGs, sorry, PCGs, then PCTs. Where are we now? CCGs. Uh, and that's all happened within 15 years. If you work that back, that means an average of about two and a half years for each of those um, initiatives or developments, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to join anything up, really. But we had um, funding from the FHA and from the council, and we employed uh, people who were nurses, people who were social workers. We actually had some um, people who were community workers uh, who uh, bridged the gap between primary health care teams, doctors, GPs, and uh, community nurses, etc., and district nurses, along with the social work teams. Next, we actually brought the teams together, usually in health, health centres, sometimes in GP practices, in fact, always either in health centres or in GP community health centres or GP practices, the social services, uh, social workers and occupational therapists moved in. Then we moved to management coordination. We appointed somebody who coordinated all the activity of that multi-professional group. Then we moved to integrated management. The people who were in that uh, multi-professional group were actually managed by one person, not just coordinated, but managed, line managed by one person. Uh, and then we moved, for some parts of uh, our service, to integrated organisations, especially mental health. And it moved in slightly different timescales for different parts of the service, learning disability, mental health, physical impairment. And as nationally, I have to say, this was a similar trend. Learning disability moved uh, furthest, fastest. Uh, mental health came next. And in some places, I think, anybody here from Richmond? Anybody here from Richmond? I think if we were in Richmond at the moment, we would, and you might tell me this is so in other areas as well. On the ground in Richmond, they've got um, integrated uh, community health and uh, social care teams for uh, adults with physical impairment, including older people with physical impairment. So there's a sequence that moved through there. One of the things that uh, happened was that we had a partnership with the University of Bath, which was nearby, and uh, the University of Bath researched this over that 14-year period that um, uh, table showed just now in terms of the 
stages we went through in terms of did it make any difference. One of the things that they looked at was um, uh, what was the view of the professionals, the different um, health and social care professionals integrating into those teams? And they found that, which goes back to that conversation we were having earlier. So in addition to the understanding about each other's roles and respecting that, it is much easier to in communicate with each other if you're sitting beside each other in the same room, isn't it? Rather than doing it by email or having to think about the telephone call. And the other thing that they did was, well, it wasn't a uh, controlled, well, was it a control study? It wasn't a, a randomly controlled study. But because we were going through this change process, and not every part of the um, area, Wiltshire, could move at the same pace at the same time, it actually provided a natural experimental opportunity for us, where we could look at those areas that had moved towards integrated, co-located, integrated management services to those which were still separately located, separate manage, separately managed. Did it make any difference, moving towards integration? Well, and the Bath University study looked at 393 older people, 195 of them, about half, were in the integrated and integrating services, and the other 198, 200 or, or thereabouts, were in the separately um, located and separately managed health and social care services. And the people who were interviewed were interviewed twice over a nine-month period. And there was a whole range of... Um, test instruments that uh, we use to measure whether it made any difference. Do you think it made any difference? What difference do you think it made, if any at all? Can you hear that? Can you say again, sorry. Uh, not having to give the same information to a number of different professionals, giving it to one who would then share the information. I do think it made any difference in terms of their quality of, their, of life and what happened to them in their lives. It may have been a, a good experience until the process was better, but do you think it had any difference in terms of outcomes? No? You're not convinced, are you? You don't think this integration is such a good idea after all, by the sounds of it. Does it make any difference in terms of outcomes? I think the patients would be less depressed and less stressed. Less depressed and less stressed, the patients. The clients. They're not having to fight the system. Okay. Any other comments in terms of did it make any difference? Do you think there are any negative consequences? I'll give you a clue. What was found was that, picking up partly what you were saying, people got easier access to the integrated services. How was that measured? By self and family referrals as compared to being referred on by a health visitor, community nurse, GP or a social worker referring into uh, healthcare services. You didn't have to go through a secondary route to actually get into the service. The services were located, co-located within these community areas, so they were on your doorstep, and you didn't have to go to one to try and get access to the other. So by measuring it in terms of self-referrals and family referrals compared to referrals between professionals, significant difference there, easier access. Secondly, people got a quicker response. It's partly related to that. If you refer yourself and you're referring yourself into a service or your family is, your carers are, into a service where um, uh, everybody's together, you're more likely to get out and get a quicker response to that. Actually, I'll tell you where that was particularly um, significant. And I say this as a social worker and the director of social services. Community nurses and district nurses gave a quick response anyway. They didn't have in trays and baskets waiting for allocation. If it came in, you got up and did it. Whereas social workers, people like me, used to have a weekly allocation meeting. The stuff would stack up for a week and then you'd have a team meeting. And when I was a team manager, there'd be a team of 12 people or whatever and everybody's eyes would be looking at the carpet because no one wanted to catch my attention. Because <laughs> if they did, they knew the work was possibly coming in their direction. Keep your head down. Uh, but it would take a week, 10 days for anybody to get out there then. We learned that we ought not to be doing that. If the district nurses can get out in a day after referrals come in, we can do it as well. So people got a quicker response. And, although not uh, significant statistically, people got a wider range of services. Because people weren't only thinking about their service and what they could do. They were talking to colleagues in uh, the multi-professional team. And people got a wider range of responses and services as a, as a consequence of that. Good news, yeah? Any negative consequences? What happens when you put a load of problem solvers, people like you and me, 
together in the same room and we share more and more information about the difficulties that somebody's having? The answer is we start frightening each other. And one of the uh, outcomes of that is that there was a trend towards more admissions to residential nursing homes because we collected more information about the difficulties that people were experiencing. And once we had that information, we became frightened with it. And once we became frightened with it, we were a bit risk averse. So we were promoting, we couldn't afford to do this financially, but we were promoting more people into residential nursing home care quicker. And a bit at the bottom has nothing to do with the research in terms of outcomes, but just as a side issue, we found really high levels of stress amongst carers and amongst older people. Going back to those indices, that were those measures we were using earlier about what were the characteristics of the users, of the patients and of the carers, because family carers were involved in the study as well, was a really high incidence of depression. 45% of the older people, most of them undiagnosed, had a, uh, once measured a clinical level of depression which required a, required a response. For the carers, it was between 20 and 25% unrecognised in terms of uh, what we had been uh, doing. So let, let me just finish that, but that, that, that's enough of me really. Um, so that's one little story about integration in one area and why it may make a good idea. I left there in 2006. You can ask me later uh, what happened after I left. I'll tell you what happened actually, it fell apart. Not because of me, but because that was a time when um, Patricia Hewitt was the Secretary of State and she demanded within one year that the F NHS balance its books. You may remember that, 2006. Uh, and uh, our NHS community locally was about £42 million uh, over budget. And it uh, was di directed by the SHA that I had to reclaim that £42 million, it, it was told, within 12 months, which wasn't feasible. But one of the ways it reclaimed the money, uh, at least a proportion of it, is all those lead purchasing arrangements that we'd undertaken within the council when, for example, the big psychiatric hospitals the big learning disability hospitals were closing and we'd taken on the, the lead purchasing responsibility for those placements in the community. The NHS withdrew from those lead purchasing agreements and the council wasn't willing to enforce them legally so we picked up a 12 million hit in one year. And it all fell apart very, very quickly because the other bit was we need to rationalise on uh, the health service um, uh, estate buildings, we're closing down these community health centres, we're centralising back in, we were kicked off the sites. So this is a bit about um, the danger of churn and change in terms of even when over a period of time we've built up a joint commitment. If we don't have those people staying around and new people come in and they're given a different agenda to prioritise, then uh, it can uh, all fall apart very, very quickly. Very quick story, and it picks off the bit about rehabilitation as well as the possible discharge. Um, my mother uh, had um, uh, osteoarthritis and uh, spondylitis. Uh, and lived down in Cornwall, which is where I come from. Uh, and she was in and out of the community hospital very regularly uh, because of pain control and got out of control. Uh, and she would freeze in bed, etc. So in a year, she'd be in and out three or four times. Uh, and when she got in, she stuck. She'd go in, they'd control the pain, but she'd be there for another four or five or six weeks. And during that time, she lost muscle tone, confidence, etc. And she ended up in a, in a residential care home. I was just picking up what you were saying about rehabilitation. And on one occasion, she used to ring me when, when it got bad at home. And she rang me on one occasion and said, I've had the rats in. And I thought, oh no, we don't need rats on top of everything else. And the rats stood for the rapid um, assessment team, I'm <laughs> pleased to say, not um, big mice. Uh, and the rap rapid assessment team was made up of, um, and you know the story, and this is nothing novel, but it was working really well down there, because they kept my mother at home then. Uh, for a period of time. It was made up of um, uh, district nurses, it was made up of uh, occupational therapists, it was made up of physiotherapists, it was made up of uh, a social worker, and it was made up of um, uh, a group of home carers who could do night sitting as well as day services. And it was available seven days a week. Uh, on three occasions, they stopped my mother going into hospital by deploying themselves for only four or five days at a time, but including some night sitting services for a couple of days as well, until it got back into control. And just in terms of, you know, going back to the three E's bit there, that probably would have been three or four months in hospital for my mother in different times. Instead of that, she had something like 10, 12 days of um, uh, quick input. Better for her, much more efficacious in terms of the service as well. And my last comment, because I'm aware of the time, is just picking up what Cathy was saying there. 
And if I'm going to leave you with, if I might, one big message is that, yeah, formal structures give us the architecture in which we work. It's how we behave informally, how much we're committed and champions for ourselves, how much we're determined to make it happen locally, regardless of what's happening nationally, but which will determine at the end of the day and whether we crack this or not. It is something to be cracked. It is a good idea. And this bit about um, having, uh, you know, what I was saying earlier and what Cathy was re relating to there, time when we just actually build up relationships, trust and confidence with each other to be able to do it is as important as all the committee meetings and the board meetings that we have. Thanks very much.